Growing up, I had like 10 games that I played over and over and over. Some of you can relate, I'm sure. A few of them were Super Mario Strikers for the GameCube, Super Mario Strikers Charge for the Wii, and Punch-Out for the Wii. Every time I saw that Next Level Games logo, I kinda assumed it was gonna be a good ad game. And as it turns out, it wasn't always the case. Today, I'm gonna go through the entire library in the game studio to see if I can find out something about them or what narrative I can create from them because there isn't that much on the wiki aside from what games they develop for. I'm excited to learn about this company whose games infested my brain as a wee babe. Let's get started. Next Level Games is a Canadian developer founded in August 2002 by Eric Randall, Douglas Tronsgaard, Jason Carr, and David Catlin. The creation of Next Level is pretty interesting. They're apparently the remnants from the Black Box Games development team. Before Next Level Games was formed, Black Box released officially licensed NHL games, Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit 2, and the most pivotal key to their current success, Sega Soccer Slam. It seems like the least important game on that list, but you'll see if you don't already. Black Box Games is currently a subsidiary of EA. Coincidentally, or maybe not at all considering who we're talking about, let's be real, Next Level Games was formed shortly after Black Box was acquired by EA. I can imagine they wanted a bit more freedom to create what they wanted, which they might not have started out with because their first game that they developed on their own was NHL Hits Pro. I don't know anything about this, but people apparently regard this game as close to, if not the peak, of NHL games. It was the first to adopt the now standardized NHL gameplay and had segments where you could just beat the dog shit out of each other. Opening flurry. This is a real seesaw battle. Be thankful if team photos were already taken. This game being so highly rated, as well as being the last time that a good portion of the old Black Box team worked on it, further cements how EA homogenized and boring as fuckified sports games. It's obvious that this team had developed a talent for cartoon violence, and it would inform what they later did. The next game they would only assist with in 2004, likely because they impressed Midway on the other published game NHL Hits Pro. The Suffering is a third person action survival horror game. It look... Fucking weird. Stupid, schlocky, and super violent. I might play it someday, it looks kinda sick. <laughs> the next game began their long relationship with Nintendo, which I believe is a huge reason as to why I don't see much of Next Level's opinion anywhere. Very reserved and respectful. It kind of reflects Nintendo in a lot of ways. Except when it comes to piracy, then the Nintendo ninjas is going to be watching you at all hours of the day behind your walls in order to steal your balls. Don't have any, roughly 3% of you might be saying, they'll find a way. They'll find a way. To understand the creation of Mario Strikers, you gotta take a look back at Black Box's Sega Soccer Slam, released in 2002, which, uh... So clean compared to my day. Yeah, it's worse Mario Strikers. You can definitely feel their future games waiting to be uncovered. Similar passing and shooting mechanics, different teams have unique advantages, you can tackle the ball, take away from others. Very distinct 2D art style for the game's menu, characters were given intros and victory animations, you get it, it does a lot of stuff really similar. Nintendo was researching games to base their Mario Soccer spin-off on and decided on Sega Soccer Slam. So they contacted Black Box, which I imagine went something like this. Blackbox Games. Hello, this is Nintendo. Oh, oh my god, Mr. Nintendo, it's an honor to speak with you. I know. Anyway, we are going to create a Mario Soccer game, which is not racist. It is how you say soccer in Japanese. We wanted to enlist your services, as you've worked on Sega Soccer Slam. Thank you for the Japanese fun fact, Mr. You're Nintendo. welcome. Uh, but the development team created their own studio not long ago. Hello? Hello? Mr. Nintendo? Nintendo then sought out Next Level Games to develop their soccer title. In 2005, Mario Strikers improved upon everything Sega Soccer built. The kicks had more weight, screen shades, crazy effects in general. Tackles felt more violent and satisfying. Items were introduced to cause more mayhem, which was really fun in multiplayer. There was also kind of a final boss that you had to beat to play as them. The game had main Mario characters as captains with minor Mario enemies as teammates. The final boss team was made of robots made for Bowser, and they could all do the supercharge kick that guarantees you can score a goal 
control if you get the timing right. They all had the power of a main character and could do that move. It felt a little unfair, but that's kind of what made the boss so fun. What really set me over the edge about this game was the parody of these characters. Everyone was being a dick. Peach and Daisy were being such fucking bitches and it was so hot! This obviously doesn't represent these characters, although I wish it did. The only place that you can get this kind of personality from these characters was the Superstar RPG on the Game Boy and the DS, or the tennis game that was on the GameCube, although they stayed true to the characters I think in those. It was so cool, I probably have tons of scratchy doodles in my notebooks for school that were thrown away one day when I was little. This is probably the fastest paced Mario spinoff game aside from Double Dash, and was especially fun with friends with all the mayhem going on. Nintendo agreed that this was a fantastic game because Next Level would then be asked to create another Strikers game, this time for the next console, the Wii. Look at the tension, the atmosphere. The presentation is so extreme that I can't help but laugh at how much of a parody it is while appreciating the energy it's going for. Bowser also has these long metal claws. Looks hard. Super Mario Strikers Charged is once again the same but better. It has the same basic gameplay with quick passing, shooting, whatever. They got more animations this time, tons of new characters, every character had their own theme. They really leaned into what made the previous one so special. I also remember really enjoying how unique every stage was. This stage felt dirty and covered in mud. This stage was in fucking space. This stage zapped a couple teammates out of existence for a round. This one had debris smashing through the course to take out a team member. It felt wild that these tournaments were taking place in these crazy ass locations like the volcano. It was out of character for Mario, sure, but it was incredible. There was also a championship mode where you go through a round robin. There was a fake little news blurb about how your team was doing and their chances in the scene as a whole. The final boss in each championship unlocked new characters and all these events. They felt so monumental. They were so cool. I can't get over how much I loved this game as a kid. Even now, I could invite a friend over and go insane over it. This game was a phenomenon. It's awesome. The very same year in 2007 saw next level release Spider-Man Friend or Foe. Spider-Man teams up with villains from a series to do something, I don't know. The biggest complaint about this game is that it felt too repetitive. It was essentially a beat em up for kids and it showed it in its simplicity. I can't help but feel like they were mercenaries at this point because next level showed that they knew how to make a great game. Time constraints likely played into it being a bit lower quality than some of their other releases since it was a movie tie-in game. It is what it is though. 2008, Ticket to Ride. Not much to say here, it was a game based on a board game of the same name. I can't imagine that many creative decisions were made to bring it to life. Same goes for the WiiWare version of Jungle Speed, released a little while after. Another card game brought to digital. Now I'm guessing here, total speculation. I think it was a quick check or a way to train new employees. The next big highlight from Next Level is 2009's Punch Out. I love Punch Out on the NES and I fucking love Punch Out for the Wii. In this game, Little Mac is the underdog in a boxing championship who is trained by his coach, Doc Lewis. They fight to the top to become the greatest fighter of his time and maintain that title for as long as possible. The graphics are cell shaded and was done so to give it a distinct look. The intention was to make anyone who briefly glanced at the game understand that this is Punch Out or at least something totally different. The gameplay runs the player through a boss rush. Fights consist of attack patterns you need to learn from the fighters. Each fighter is a caricature and were originally based on these kind of racist stereotypes. They obviously toned down the racism in a game released in 2009. If you're unable to remove the characters from their origins as racist caricatures, I totally understand. I personally thought that this was meant to be lighthearted and good fun. The characters are all so expressive and look completely different from one another. This is really good for the player because of the requirements of learning moves, timings, and tells. You can dodge left, right, or block. Super simple, but it's a little more difficult than it sounds since some fighters can be really quick and ruthless. The game was said to be a collaboration between Nintendo and Next Level. A new punch out would be crazy for me. Every now and again I play an hour or two of the original NES game and this one too. Punch Out Wii capture what made those older games special without the unreasonable difficulty of the arcade era. There was also a Club Nintendo game standalone titled Doc Lewis's Punch Out. You can train to fight characters in the game and even fight Doc Lewis who is tougher than most of the fighters in the actual game until you figure him out. I understand you gotta make your overweight coach character easier to beat than literal championship contenders, but it would be incredible to fight Doc Lewis at his toughest. I never got to play this extra bit. My mom never got internet until I was like 13. This was also the year that Next Level Games received an award. They were voted one of Canada's top 100 employers. 
it's a pretty good place to work, apparently. 2010 saw the release of two games, Transformers Cybertron Adventures, published by Activision, and Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, published by Ubisoft, both exclusive to the Wii. Now, if you take an aspiring game dev off of the street, what do you think they're going to be more excited about working on, the Transformers IP or the Ghost Recon IP? I'm pretty sure they're gonna be stoked about the Transformers shit, bro. I believe the amount of polish in these games reflect Next Level's priorities at the time. Both of these games are on-rails shooters, but Cybertron Adventure was looked back on much more fondly. There were some fun character moments and tons of interesting set pieces. It felt like there was usually something interesting to look at, while Ghost Recon didn't have the benefit of those positives and quickly faded into obscurity. Both of them being on-rail shooters really tells me that these were made either at the same time or really close to one another. It's an efficient move to fulfill some contracts. You can tell though that games that they care about get a lot more attention and love. 2011, Captain America Super Soldier published by Sega. The graphics weren't horrible, but not up to par with the biggest releases of that year. It reminded me of the earliest games on PS3. Faces looked kinda like putty. It's still pretty good though, because the amount of resources that a next level has in comparison to a PlayStation exclusive is like coughing baby versus hydrogen bomb. The combat was inspired by the Arkham series, and who can blame them? Those games are fantastic. The game, however, is linear, having the player fight to the end of the levels. You can tell they really cared though. There were zoom-ins on certain attacks, to get a more powerful impact, there was effort put in to make parkour segments to get to another portion of the stage in a fun way, and the cutscenes were pretty fun too. If this game was given time and wasn't a movie tie-in game, I have faith that the quality would have been truly spectacular. 2012, Microsoft's Solitaire Collection. I would say let's just move on, it's Solitaire, but this is the gear that they made Canada's top 100 employers once again. It's awesome seeing games made a bit more ethically than normal for the level of notoriety that they have as a games company, at least comparatively. In 2013, they released Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon. It was an impossible ask to follow up Nintendo's cult classic in Luigi's Mansion, and they blew it. Or I guess you could say they, uh, 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 they're, uh, stupid. Kidding. Plainly, this game is mechanically superior. There's a lot more to actually do and should feel better to play, but it don't. It doesn't have the same thing that made the original Luigi's Mansion so beloved. Basically, it's not a horror game for kids anymore. The mansion isn't dark and gloomy, there are no more portrait ghosts to add a little narrative to the game, the music isn't haunting, it's whimsical. It was a silly little adventure featuring our scaredy cat hero, Luigi. I think if you look at the game on its own merits and detach it from the beautiful classic, Dark Moon is pretty good. Sequels are always going to be compared to previous games in their series, though, and this contributed to the game's mixed reception. Dark Moon isn't going to be a gripping thing for me as an adult, but someone who appreciates animation, characterization, for this little guy that so often appears like a soulless avatar for running and jumping, you gotta imagine, this was great. Next level strengths seem to be on display here, in Mario Strikers Charged, and Punch-Out for the Wii. They excel at expressive character animation and stylized graphics. Nintendo must have been so impressed because a year later, they would officially become a subsidiary of Nintendo and it was a long time coming too. I don't think there's a better video game company giant to be bought out by. They're not perfect, but they're a lot more safe than EA or Ubisoft if your goal is to continue working on new and exciting games. The future was looking bright for next level games. Some of their best games were all published by Nintendo, so this was a no-brainer, and I couldn't wait to see what they would work on next. Metroid Prime was doomed from the start and ended up garnering poor audience reception. This is likely due to no Metroid game being announced for several years and the newest one shown to the public being a spin-off that had nothing to do with the previous games, aside from playing what feels like fodder that was established in the series. The art style didn't help either. Big bobble-headed characters piloting big bobble-headed mechs. It gave a more light-hearted impression which fans of the series did not appreciate. Despite it all, from what I can tell, this game went extremely underappreciated at launch. It was a competent shooter for the 3DS that drags alone and really shines as it was designed to be played with friends. I'd call it a cult classic, but that would require a cult in the first place. Next Level Games really wanted something great out of this. In an interview about Metroid Prime Federation Force with Jason Carr, they just kept giving us better and better IPs to work with. Nintendo clearly believed in the quality of the game and Next Level's passion because they would once again be entrusted with a Luigi's Mansion title. This time, it would be a huge release for the Nintendo Switch. Here you can see Hannibal Burris chilling with Luigi. Relevant to the video? Probably not. Important to me? Yes. Released in 2019, Luigi's Mansion 3 builds upon what was established in Dark Moon for the 3DS. Again, the series would not be returning to that horror aesthetic that made the game beloved, and at this point, it shouldn't be surprising. This game is drop-dead gorgeous, and the music is a lot more notable than on the 3DS. It felt like I was playing a Luigi's Mansion movie with all the little details and how Luigi acted. The environments were 
always fantastic. I was admiring them the whole game. Look at all the little details they added to Luigi to make him just as bouncy and expressive as possible. He is so fucking cute! Look at him! I'll stop harping on it, but man, the whole game was pretty. Bright colors, smooth models, and brilliant brilliant lighting. Throughout the game, there were tons of puzzles to keep you occupied as the game was progressing. The game focuses on exploration rather than combat, which is way better for the game given what they were already doing with the series. Instead of dispersed levels like in Dark Moon, the game once again takes place in this giant location. It's a massive hotel, and they get as wacky as they want with each floor's theming. I am, however, disappointed that most of the ghosts just don't have a lot of personality other than the boss characters. Still, though, that's an improvement from Dark Moon. I played the game with my kid sister, and it was really fun. She was Gooigi, and the idea of getting a game over really scared her, so uh, she didn't want to play Luigi. I really recommend playing this with your partner or some family. Definitely your kid if you have one. Otherwise, the puzzles might be too easy for an adult that plays games regularly. Now about Luigi's Mansion's direction, Nintendo obviously wanted to keep this on the path of being a whimsical family adventure rather than a perilous trek through a haunted mansion. Given who their largest demographic is, I just can't blame them. Similarly, Next Level Games' most recent release will see a drastic change likely implemented by Nintendo to maintain that family-friendly image. Mario Strikers Battle League released in 2022, and just looking you can see the departure from the old Strikers games. Like Luigi's Mansion 3, the animations are bouncy and rich, but it lacks the parodic attitude that the Strikers series had been known for. The championship modes that featured round robins and finals matches were removed and replaced by a simple championship bracket. There also isn't an increase in stakes or a feeling of a different occasion, it just feels like you can experience everything the game has to offer with one championship run. The gameplay itself is actually pretty good. It adds several mechanics for you to improve at and think about, but somehow the game on the Wii just felt better and faster while doing less. The environments have become generic, and the stage hazards that made some matches absolute chaos are gone. Characters no longer have their own themes. The music is much less distinct and memorable. Although there is a lot of customizability, it doesn't end up feeling exciting in any way. Instead of creating a supportive team of minor enemy characters, the entire teams are full of main Mario characters. It seems fun on paper, but it ends up making them feel a lot less special and getting rid of the feeling of a believable fandom of characters. It used to feel like they were celebrities and larger than life characters, but now it just feels like they're competitors, if that makes any sense. It's especially demystifying when opposing teams reuse use characters in the same tournament as well. It's not as fun. To make it even worse, the character selection was also pretty slim on launch, so it's a little unfortunate. I've lost all hope for the Mario spin-offs being fun again. Mario Golf, Tennis, Party, and now Strikers all seem to be following a simple and basic formula of making something cute without much thought or personal input. I think they wanted to set up an approachable template with all of these games, uh, so they could continuously add onto it like Mario Kart 8. They're all fun, I guess, but I'm never gonna want to play it away from others. With all these games being similar in that way, I can imagine that this was Nintendo's ultimate vision, to have a homogenous, predictable, and marketable set of spin-off titles. Sorry, I got a little off track. This video is about Next Level. It's kind of lame to go out on such an average game, but I'm still hopeful that Next Level will be given the opportunity to flex a little more on something ambitious because I know they're capable of creating something amazing. At least they got out before EA killed them. Overall, Next Level Games had some bangers and it had some flops, although honestly, it feels like a lot of those flops were made due to harsh time restrictions from their publishers, poor timing, or Nintendo meddling. I'm still excited to see what'll come out of this company. The bright spots of this company's time making video games were shining stars for me. A new Punch-Out would be crazy, a return to the Metroid series would be pretty cool, or another Nintendo IP, and what I prefer, something entirely original. I'm Frogwater, and I hope you enjoyed. I've never done this type of video, but I thought it'd be an interesting experiment putting my little spotlight on a dev that was a huge part of me growing up. In the future, I'd love to do something similar to this for other devs that I'm interested in, and hopefully I can take what I learned making this and make it better. That's all I got. I, I appreciate you joining me, and I'll see you next time. Whenever that may be. Later. Aquí está el partido de semifinales entre los eternos archirrivales. Aquí está llegando en este momento Mario.